Some 10 years ago, a little glint of fire ruptured the relative peace enjoyed by agrarian, farming, and nomadic communities of northern Nigeria. With little or no attention paid to it, it soon began to spread like a cancerous tissue. I had a picture of a malignant cancer, of a tissue which has been attacked by cancer. And I said that this thing will become like a malignant cancer. It touches Sokoto Zamfara border, Zamfara Kebi border, Zamfara Katsena border, Zamfara Kaduna border, and that is how the whole co conflict keep on moving. It is a moving conflict. This is called banditry, the rural criminality that is fast evolving and has become perhaps the most challenging security threat for Nigeria at the moment, overtaking the insurgency in the Northeast in terms of casualty figures in recent months. Nobody will give you the statistics with high level of accuracy on the number of people killed. In my own opinion, there are over 70,000 people killed from the beginning of this conflict to date. The violence has also led to displacement of hundreds of thousands of villagers in the last 10 years, with some of them still taking refuge in public buildings, markets, and other places. Aside persons who have moved to other Nigerian cities, over 50,000 others are reported to be taking refuge across the border in Niger Republic. Many rural dwellers in the affected states have bitter tales to tell. Hadiz Asani from the village of Ura Agama Lafia in Zurmi local government of Zawfara state recalls how her community was displaced. The hollow left in the heart of Zainab Ibrahim is one that will never heal. She still cries, she says, when she remembers how her little son was slaughtered before her eyes. The <laughs> Not only was her little child killed, Zainab was kidnapped and tortured for two months. Children like young Hawa are not spared of the traumatic experience. These victims now live under the care of a man who has become a shield to many of the vulnerable victims. Alhaji Muhammadu Bako Sarkin Yamma in the outskirts of Gusau, the Zampara state capital. With the mass killings and displacement, the people's source of livelihood is adversely cut down as farmlands were either abandoned or raised by the attackers. We have at least 80% of where the food is grown and where the uh, herders operate 
peacefully in those days. We have at least 80 percent of them that have been affected and affected in almost absolute terms. Just go to, so go to Katana and see traumatized you know, uh, villages who have moved to the major cities. You know, people who under normal circumstances will not beg have been transformed into, into beggars. Women, you know, responsible women have been transformed into uh, prostitutes. They have to feed themselves, they have to feed their children. Many of them have lost their, their, their husbands. How do we deal with this trauma? In the past decade, militia groups formed initially by the use of Fulani ethnic background have grown into cantankerous gangs engaging in cattle wrestling, arson, mass killings and kidnapping for ransom and attracted willing collaborators. When they started the recruitment, they were actually looking and seeking for support from their fellow Fulani folks. And those that populated the first generation of these people we call the bandits were initially Fulani because it was a Fulani problem. Their indulgence in this crime is aided by their access to small and light weapons. These arms range from the more common AK-47 rifles to more sophisticated machine guns and rocket launchers. The arms find their ways into the hands of the criminal groups, mainly from the vast open border Nigeria shares with the Nigerian Republic. You know, accumulation are many problems. Libya, Chad, Mali, arms and ammunition finding their way into Nigeria. How do they come to Nigeria? They have to come through the Nigerian Republic. In 2021 alone, 9,423 Nigerians were killed in the orgy of violence in different parts of the country, with the six state afflicted by banditry recording 4,104 deaths. Those blamed for the atrocities today are people who for years lived in peace with their neighbors. Senator Said Ansadaw, whose community forms the epicenter of the rural banditry, recalls the peace times. I recall with the nostalgia, you know, when the Fulani settle in an individual farm, if they are having naming ceremony, they invite uh, uh, the indigenous uh, farmers to the naming ceremony. Uh, we used to spend the whole day, you know, in the ruga of the Fulani, you know, uh, during Kumfra, Uznono, eating the kind of rice they cook. Normally, when they cook rice, they put uh, milk inside it. Very nice, very unique, you know. So it was uh, quite a smooth and cordial relationship. Alhaji Usman Ali Ugangara, the district head of Gangara in Sokoto's Sabon Birni local government, whose community was run down by bandits in November 2021, and a young man, Hassan Dongkwaru, took over control of the village, lives in shock and disbelief. He fights back tears as he recalls the events. <laughs> So the look at it, I had a number of times she don't came so high. I don't remember you a lot, say that I watch. Such aggression, he says, was never imagined because of the cordiality of relationships between Hausa and Fulani communities in the area only a few years ago. But the researchers and followers of the conflict say the seed of the violent uprising today was sowed from those days of seeming peace as injustice by local leaders and security agents, as well as neglect of pastoral communities, eroded trust and bred disaffection. One seminar I attended, some of the leaders came and said the police called them ATM. ATM. The police. The Al Ali, the area court, the traditional rulers have realized that a typical Pulani Keturiara detest being detained or his child being detained. 
because I have seen it, rather than detain a typical fly in Riara for two days, he prefers, in fact, you kill his two children. Why? Because if you detain him, he has nowhere to detain you. But if you kill his uh, children, no matter how long, if you kill his two children, he'll come and kill your own time. So, and my belief is that they have some superstitious belief about detention or imprisonment. And that's why, rather than detain them in, in, in two days in police custody, they wouldn't mind giving you 20,000, 30,000. If I remember the, some of the celebrated cases we actually intervened in was around the Bakori area in, 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 in Katsina uh, State, where many of them were arrested. Uh, uh, on Trump up charges. What, what do I mean by Trump up charges? They have been using the library for years, for years. Overnight, the library was handed over to one businessman. Uh, they didn't know anything about it. They were coming from wherever they were coming and they were charged for actually trespass. Some of them were arrested and locked uh, in, 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 in prison. And, and then thieves were encouraged to move into their own uh, hamlet and steal whatever they had. This happened in the 70s, I'm telling you, around 76, 77. Another dimension is the unchecked immigration of foreigners into the vast forests in these areas. At the end of the civil war in Chadi, between Gokon Wadai and Hussein Hebri, a large number of Fulani, you know, migrated to Nigeria. And they went as far as to around my village. Because some of the Fulanis, when they migrated to our area, recognized them. They were even saying, look, we are in trouble. With this kind of Fulani migrating to this area, no matter how long, both the farmers and we, the original Fulanis, we are going to be in trouble. Farming herders came from far, as far as Guinea and Mali into this area. And it was them that had the culture of violence which they introduced to our communities. A 2019 report commissioned by the Mfara State Government identifies many issues around governance failure, lack of social justice and social imbalance as factors that created the atmosphere for the conflict. For a long period of time, they've been subjected to all sorts of oppression, you know, exertion by our leaders in this part of Nigeria. One of the oldest bandits operating out of Zamfara State, Sheikh Rekif, re-echoes some of these issues. I was born in the village of Karatu. 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 Oh, you can't touch it. So boy, I'm not any aiki. So like so, so sorry so, so sorry do just babu one. And so now move babu that alone. Babu da woni abunda zamuchi. Babu da abunda zamu mukalla. Babu shi da gamuse itachi. Well, all the bandits like Rekif and a few others have spent years engaged in low-scale criminal activities, mostly cattle rustling and arm robbery. The current wave of violence that come to be known as banditry is traceable to the 2011 murder of the Fulani community leader, al Haji Ishe, at Chilim village of Ansado district in Zamfara state. Who was al Haji Ishe? Ishe is like a Fulani activist. And to be fair to him, he's a fairly honest person. That whenever there is misunderstanding between Fulani and farmers, he used to go and assess the situation. If a Fulani is wrong, you tell the Fulani you are wrong. And he made the Fulani to pay compensation to farmers. And if farmers are wrong, they also tell the farmer they are wrong. And if the farmer is notorious, Ishe will lead the victim from the Fulani to court. To the extent that he will go and hire lawyers in order to protect uh, the, the Fulani. Not only that, if a traditional ruler uh, is also oppressing the Fulani, he also confronts him. And in fact, investigation of recent 
has shown a clear insight into what actually led to his mother. It was this his activism confronted traditional rulers that led to his mother. They made a lot of utterances telling the, telling the general public that they will not and never allow the soul of Alaji Ishii to go like that. There must be vengeance. And that was the major trigger that one could actually uh, think about. The response by local communities to increasing crimes carried out by criminal youth of Fulani stock was to constitute a volunteer force called the Nsakai, armed ostensibly to protect their communities from the bandits' aggression. Initially, what they did was they identified, you know, thieves in the area, in inverted commas, thieves in the area who reside in the various villages and towns. And they killed them. Many of them were killed. After killing them, they now moved into the bush and attacked uh, Fulani, you know, hamlets in those bush. People who had nothing to do with the conflict in the, in the town. The only crime they, they've committed was to be Fulani. So they attacked them and many of them were killed. It is a pattern we were able to establish across north, northwest. We've interviewed many uh, people. So it's the same party in Sake, you know, taking the loss into their own hands. Wallahi, wallahi, a question that would be on at the Sakani, not Allah, and Sake, so Katari, so Sakani, Machet, and Namid, and Nayaru, and maybe Lahi, and some of the Motor Lady, and Kashi, Wallahi, Wallahi, Sidi, Ajiva, Machese, Ayanki, Sakani, not Allah, and Amy Mata, and Anta, Wallahi, the Rene, Ajiva, Ajiva, the Gara, the Rua, Wallahi, the Rua. This is the road linking Sokoto with the eastern parts of the state to places like Sabonberni, Goronyo and Isa. These are areas most affected by banditry in the state. And though this is a very important road linking Sokoto to other parts of the country, travelers are now afraid of plying the road because of instances of attacks on motorists. We travel to some of the areas most affected to see for ourselves the devastation caused by banditry. We speak to a prominent leader of one of the civilian groups fighting back the bandits who defends the action of his men as he accused the bandits of committing greater atrocities. Anche ana kama fulani ana yankiwa. Shinsu bandits deke tahu wa suzaka gagali sokashi mutun sama da talatin ko arba in. Shinsu ba aga masala desun kaiba Sitat Lambanga, I come of flat and yakashi. A bombaganach. Bundis, a quick gay day when the sun cashier won a summer get Arbaya Taman. Mimutan and the sun For many years, security forces are engaged in operations to root out the bandits, including through aerial bombardments with mixed results. Several bandits and collaborators were also arrested at different times. With the results from military operation taking long in coming, governments in the affected states adopted various approaches to containing the violence. The Zamfara and Kazan state governments went into dialogues with some of the key bandits and offered amnesty in exchange for ceasefire. But all the past talks have collapsed, for what experts attribute to the bandits' erratic nature and the lack of diligence, processes and sincerity on the parts of the governments. We said to engage them, and gradually we were able to bring most of the leaders out and they agreed to lay down arms. We did that, that led to surrendering of over 350 assorted AK-47 uh, machine guns and uh, uh, grenades, uh, local uh, lay-made guns, and many other over 350. It went on very well. We had uh, uh, peace for almost 18 to 24 months, except normal criminality here and there. Marches uh, started flourishing in the communities. As we approached 2019, what we did in Kazina was not done in Zampara. Zampara constituted 70% of our problem. 
was not there in Zamfara. The, uh, the approach was different from us. Likewise in Kaduna. So we were left alone gradually before the election of 2019. Almost all the leaders that we had an agreement with were killed. To understand the deep-seated issues, we traveled to Shinkafi local government in Zamfara State to meet one of the persons whose name rings the bell in Nigeria's banditry landscape. Bello Turji is linked to some of the most audacious attacks on villages between Zamfara and Sokoto states, including a raid on a security base in Savon Birni and murder of travelers who were burnt in a bus late last year. His story resembles the scenario painted by researchers on the experience of many Fulani youth turned bandits. <laughs> Turji bemoans the bloodbath, admitting his role in the violent campaigns. But says he is ready to turn a new leaf as he calls for a dialogue to be led by traditional and religious leaders. The kingpin also dissociates bandits like him from jihadist groups saying they have no political agenda. The Emir of Bungudu, Al Haj Hassan At Tahiru, who had himself spent 32 days in the hands of bandits following his abduction in a highway kidnapping last year, acknowledges the role traditional rulers like him can play in arresting the situation. There is a social approach that has to be taken. Now, we have lost out our farmlands, we have lost out our hiding environment. This were the this were multi billion naira vacations. We were, which, who, which, uh, which, which uh, employed millions of people. You know, so we have to find a way of restoring these things, and that's the only thing that will make people go back and have uh, means of livelihood, and also, you know, have some economic means by which to can, they can get, go out of the bandit. It's not going to be easy, but I assure you that if there is synergy between all concerned people, effective synergy, not just by word of mouth. I'm sure we could solve this problem in not the too distant future. The EMEA says it is important to explore all avenues that will lead to ending the carnage. There has to be some, uh, you know, comprehensive collaboration so that we can evolve a tactic of utilizing every strength that we have. Opportunities should be given to anybody who 
is equivalent and they want to come back to become a good person. If we don't do that, they are even negating what the Almighty has ordered us to do. Uh, but then it has to be done in a very controlled manner. With the bandits relapse into criminal activities in the aftermath of previous peak sparks, prominent persons like Kaduna State Governor Nasir El Rufai have voiced their opposition to future talks. On its part, the federal government last year approached a court for an order declaring the bandits as terrorists and went ahead to gazette the ruling. When you now term them terrorists, it gives the military and the security uh, authorities more latitude on how to deal with them. However, experts like Dr. Rufai insist that the likelihood of ending the killings through the barrel is slim. I am talking about the nature and gravity of the problem because of the number of people serving as bandits, the number of young boys serving as active bandits within the age of 17 to even eight years, the number of people we call the part-time bandits providing a lot of services to, to the bandits, but at the end of the day, they retire back home and they are treated as innocent people. That is not even the problem. The problem is the number of people in the rural areas seeking for recruitments into banditry. So when you look at the nature of the problem, it is a problem that is just too enormous. Vis-a-vis, -vis looking at the number of the security personnel, the armed forces put together. Many of the governors agreed at the beginning to, sorry, to, to, to interact with the bandits. But right now, the same bandits went back and became even more vicious. I think we rather leave it to the you know, individual state governments to decide on whether they are going to enter into any uh, agreement with bandits or not. Uh, the federal government cannot uh, decree by fiat. But for government to dialogue, Dr. Muhammad says it has to come from a point of strength. You negotiate from a position of strength, not from a position of weakness. We need a holistic approach. In fact, internally and externally, here I'm specifically talking about uh, Niger uh, Republic. And to do that, we have to increase uh, the force. We have to equip them. We have to bring in uh, technology, uh, drones and co you know, to be able to identify their own spots. There will certainly be some collateral damages. You must have a sword analysis of the situation. Meaning, you must look at the strengths and the weaknesses of those you are going to dialogue with. And you must also understand the gravity of the problem. And this gra gravity of the problem has to do with understanding the psychology of the bandits. But beyond dialogues and military operations, observers say finding solution to the conflict will require addressing the roots of the problem. There is the need for improved justice system with a more accountable justice administration. Perpetrators on all sides should be made to face the law. There should be equitable access to education and social services. Resource challenges following the conflict should be tackled. In the immediate, however, there is the need to pay adequate attention to worsening humanitarian crises in the region.